Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Sunday service. I want to read from Psalm 99, just the first four verses, five verses. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted above the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The King is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we take you too much for granted. And we need to be reminded that you are a God who is mighty and holy and awesome, that you love justice. And we come this morning to acknowledge you as the great Yahweh, the God who is above all, the God who created us and the God whose love for us is infinite. Lord, we are grateful too that you are also the God who is close to us and that sent, you sent your son to humble himself to die on the cross for us. But Lord, let us never forget that you are our God, worthy of praise, worthy of worship, as we come this morning. Amen. I've been interested in Johnson's sermons on the parables recently. And, and while we know the parables, they're the familiar stories about the lost son, the prodigal son, the story about uh, workers in the vineyard, uh, about the unforgiving servant. They're all stories we know, but I've been challenged not just to know them, but to put them into action. And sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds. So this morning in our prayers, I'd just like us to pray silently and think about how those parables challenge us at our own point of need. Let's pray. Lord, let us hear those familiar stories, but let, them hear, let us hear them where they apply to us. If we are the prodigal, the prodigal's brother, the complaining workers, the one who struggles to forgive, Lord, challenge us in all of those parables that we might understand afresh who we are or who you want us to be in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask Ben to come and bring us the reading today. Good, good morning, everyone. Amazing to be here again. And thank, thanks, Russ, for um, getting us to read the word for you. It's a um, it's really amazing word. So... Today's uh, scripture is 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and our Lord. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serving the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Wow, what an amazing word. 
And um, now we'll get uh, Russell back up to share his message this week. Uh, can't wait to hear it. Thanks, Russell. Thanks, Ben. I find that many Christians have a favourite letter of Paul's. And what's your favourite? Is it Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Romans maybe? But even if we don't have a favourite there, we can often find a quote from each of the epistles. In Romans, I've just picked a few. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. If I asked you what was a favourite from Corinthians, someone would be sure to say, now these three remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. What about Galatians? Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. If I was to ask you what you knew of Ephesians, I'm sure someone would say, put on the full armour of God that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Or Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. One of my favourites from Colossians is from Colossians 3 verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But I wonder how many of you could quote a verse from 1 Thessalonians. Poor old 1 Thessalonians left at the back of the pile uh, and um, often uh, not known about very greatly. And it's not left at the back of Paul's letters because it's not important. If um, I found out some time ago, and this intrigued me, that the reason that Paul's letters are arranged in the way they are is purely because their size. Romans is the biggest letter, so it goes first, <laughs> and then Corinthians. And so as you go through, the letters become shorter and shorter until you come to Thessalonians. And yet the story of the Thessalonian people is an incredible story. <laughs> it's a story that we sometimes overlook. If I can take you back to Acts 17, we find that Paul and company arrive in Thessalonica. Now, they've already just been to Philippi. And at Philippi, they got a mixed reception, to say the least. And uh, there was opposition. They were put in jail. And so... It was not a great experience for them in some ways. And so they find themselves leaving Philippi under a cloud. But you remember Paul was told to come to Macedonia by an angel in a dream? And so he fulfills that purpose and he moves on and finds himself in Thessalonica. And on the first Sabbath day he goes to the synagogue. And he goes there for three weeks to preach. And there's good news and bad news. The good news is that his impact in those three weeks is amazing. People are, are touched dramatically by the power of God. And it says some people were, were transfixed and, and just followed him straight away. There were some Jews, many of them were Greeks, and there were some prominent women, it says. And that was the exciting news, that people responded to the gospel. But there's bad news too. All of a sudden, uh, people were opposed to the gospel. And while there are always people who will respond, there are people who will sometimes oppose the gospel and, so, and often it will be a nasty opposition. And so Paul was in fear or in danger of losing his life. And so there was a hasty retreat made. As far as we know, three weeks and then a hasty retreat. That's not very long to set up a church, is it? And so Paul moves on to Berea and he's still a little bit concerned about the, th the people in Thessalonica. And so he sends Timothy back. Sends Timothy because Timothy is part Greek and it would be easier for him to go back than one of the Jews. And Timothy comes back excited and tells him that they have not lost the faith. In fact, these people who are just new Christians in, in, their, in their life, were suffering persecution and standing up and proclaiming Christ under persecution. So Paul sends this letter, and he sends this letter 
as an encouragement. And he starts off in an encouraging way. But that's typical of Paul, isn't it? You know, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We, we continually remember before God and Father, your work produced by favour and so on. Paul has a way of always opening his letters with encouragement. Even the churches like the Galatian and Corinthian churches that he had to reprimand. He always opened with a sense of encouragement. In the Corinthian church, I love that, to the church of God at Corinth, the naughtiest church that he'd ever come across, but they are the church of God. And Paul starts with this encouragement and continues on in this attitude of encouragement. I want to draw your attention to verse 3. We continually remember before God, our Father and Father, your work produced by faith. Your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired in hope, in, by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, that's interesting, isn't it? Love, hope, and faith. You've heard that before, haven't you? In Corinth, in Corinth, Corinthians, Paul talks about faith, hope, and love. And here again, he said he's commending them on their work produced by faith, their labour prompted by love, their endurance inspired by hope. Faith, hope, and love. You know, it's interesting. The Thessalonians got it. <laughs> they had a minimum three weeks of exposure to the gospel and they got the idea of faith, hope and love. The Corinthians didn't. Paul spent a fair bit more time with the Corinthians. But they were so divided by one-upmanship and division and arrogance and disunity and immorality that Paul has to bring them back and say, guys, the important things are faith, hope and love. These ones get it in Thessalonica. The Corinthians had to be reminded of it. And so they were commended for their faith, hope and love. And you probably say, well, Russ, it's, people can have faith, hope and love and not have Jesus. And that's true. <laughs> and so Paul comes down then to talk about what is the motive for their faith, hope and love? What is the motive for their faith, hope and love? What is the driving force that brings them to it? It's interesting, we've had the coronavirus and, um, and Scott Morrison said, you can't gather for Easter. We said, that's okay. And then later on he said, you can't get together for Anzac Day. That's okay. And then he said, I don't want you to protest. Well, we've got a right to protest. <laughs> we believe in social justice. And many people believe in social justice. And social justice is part of the Christian gospel. But it's nothing without the backing of the other two things, the sacrifices that people have made and the sacrifice that Christ has made. What, what is the driving force behind what you do? And Paul is aware of this and he brings them back to the source because he brings them back to the Trinity. That last bit there was your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope in Lord Jesus Christ. The wonderful thing is that the people in Thessalonica who followed Jesus didn't buckle under persecution because their hope was in the risen Christ and their passion was for him to return again. In the Assam, in the uh, north northeastern part of India, there, was a, uh, there were tribes that Christians went and converted some of them to, to faith. And one of the people who was converted to faith was brought before the chief of the tribe and he asked him if he would deny his faith. And he said, no, I won't. I have decided to follow Jesus. And so he actually killed his children in front of him and he said, I want you to change your, convert from your faith. And he says, though none go with me, yet I will follow. And then he killed his wife, and then he killed him because he would not deny his faith. But that's not the end of the story. The chief was so moved by the passion of this man that he became a Christian. And if you go to the Assam today, it's one of the few areas in, in India where the, whole, where, the, where the majority of people follow Jesus Christ. People have been inspired to write a song about that. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. 
So none go with me, yet I will follow. The world before me, the cross the cross before me, sorry, the world behind me. We have our hope in Christ Jesus and nothing else. That was the way the Thessalonians put their hope. But in verse 4, he goes on and he says, We are loved by God, chosen. Chosen. He, God has chosen you because the gospel did not simply come with words but also with power. We are people chosen. In God's economy, his infinite love is poured out in for us. There is always room for one more in the family of God. And finally, he says in verse 4, we are, by, we are um, but also with the power of the Holy Spirit and deep convention, conviction. Can you see those three things? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They had faith, they had hope, they had love. And they were a model to all the believers in Macedonia. They were a wonderful group of people as I see that. They were young, they were new in their faith, they were enthusiastic and they were persecuted. I'm old, I've been in my faith a long time, I'm comfortable and I sit in my little chair. And I find as I read this, I am challenged by the passion of these people. The challenge for me is to renew my faith, to empower my faith through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Not only to empower my faith, but to proclaim. It's interesting that as we follow this, Paul got stoned when he went from town to town. When I go to people's places, I get a cup of tea. <laughs> And maybe we've been a group of Christians that are floating on tea and feeling very comfortable. And I'm drawn to these people because of their resilience, even through faith, and even through suffering, I should say. We live in a different world today. But it's a world that's changing. It's a world that is becoming more and more opposed to the gospel. As a young person, it was acceptable to be a Christian. Today, it's not flavour of the month. So how will we handle a future where we will suffer, perhaps, as the Thessalonians did? By knowing that we are loved as God loves us. By being strengthened and given hope through our faith in Jesus Christ. And through the resilience and power of the Holy Spirit. By trusting in a God who empowers us, who leads us, and loves us, that we might be, like those Thessalonians, a model for the people and the world around us, in spite of what it takes to do that. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you for this little letter that Paul wrote, a short letter, a brief letter, and yet a letter where he acknowledges the passion of the people. Lord, we pray that we would have that passion too. Amen. Just a reminder of the offering and um, uh, your offerings are well received and please continue to support Johnson and the church. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.